Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Urs Kaster. I'm with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and I uh, also have the pleasure currently to be involved in the Secretariat of the Global Network of Internet and Society Centers. And uh, within that context, it's actually a real pleasure to welcome two wonderful, brilliant European colleagues who are um, the heads and co-heads of the Department of Innovation and Digitalization in Law at the University of Vienna. Um, and this department is actually the latest addition to the growing uh, network of centers. Um, uh, we have uh, Professor Christiane Wendehorst and uh, my um, old friend, if I may say, uh, Professor uh, Nicolas Forgo, who are joining us uh, for an informal chat about their department um, and the great work you're doing. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I know it's rather late in Vienna, so it's a pleasure to be in conversation even at this late hour. Feels a bit more like a, a fireside chat at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Great. So I, I checked out your website and realized um, that the department was, I think, launched in 2017. Um, but obviously, both of you are, are world renowned experts and have been in the field for much longer. And I was just uh, so impressed to see the breadth and depth of activities at, at, the, at your department, at the Institute uh, in, in German, and was wondering whether you can just share a few highlights, uh, maybe some of the projects you're most excited about, and, uh, and then we can also talk about, you know, um, the communities you've built. Uh, I know it's a very interdisciplinary place where you build bridges, uh, not only across departments, but also across communities and um, uh, do great work uh, to inform policy making. So I hope you can talk about that too. But first, mm -hmm. what are you working on? What are you excited about these days? <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. Christiane? Nicolas, you want to start? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Well, first of all, it's it's great uh, to be joining this network. So and we were so excited when we received your message. And um, it's wonderful to, to join this community. Um, as you already said, our department was um, uh, founded only in 2017, and in fact, it's Nikolaus, you know, who's the at the, the heart of this department, and uh, who's really the pillar of this. Um, so um, it's it's him here really who started this, and uh, it was me then who joined. I'm a member of both departments, Department of Private Law and Department of Innovation and Digitization and Law. So I think Nikolaus and I um, work in different areas, but there's also a great deal of overlap. So um, I, for example, um, have spent a lot of time recently um, advising national governments and EU institutions. You know, I was co-chair of the Data Ethics Commission advising the German government. You know, of course, because you're a member of the Digitalrat. So um, uh, I've done a lot of work for the European Commission recently, a member of the expert group on liability and new technologies just finished a study on uh, software safety and liability, also advised uh, the, the European Parliament in the, in the liability sphere. Uh, but I also have, do a lot together with the, with the US. Uh, you may know that um, I'm the European head for the ALI, ELI project on a data economy. And um, we're, we sometimes talk about this, Nikolaus. So uh, there, there's a lot of, of, of overlap with, with the work that's going on at the department. So today, for example, we had a meeting uh, with ALI colleagues, with ULC colleagues to see how we can join forces and how we can align our work um, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. So that's uh, uh, really an important part of my work. And then of course, you know, there are many individual projects such as with the Academy of Sciences, such as uh, a, a project I'm now starting on unfair algorithmic practices uh, and uh, a work on 
consumer law and enforcement of the digital age. So these are projects and, and uh, you know, the, 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 the wonderful thing is that uh, Nikolaus and I and all the other uh, members of the Institute, we work on different areas, but um, we, we, we come together, we meet regularly, we exchange views and uh, that is really so enriching for uh, our work at the faculty and at the Institute. But uh, Nikolaus, I'm sure you you because you're really the the <laughs> main person here. So you would yeah. like to uh, present the institute as such. Thank I'm you. sure Christiana is too too modest. I, I, I'm yeah. sure. Of course, of course she is certainly of course uh, as always. Um, actually, thank you so much, Louis, for having us here, and it's really a pleasure to see you again. I I, I think we met for the first time somewhere in 2002 or so, if I'm not mistaken, so really long time ago. You then still being in Switzerland, I think, and me still being in Hanover then uh, in Germany. Um, and and it's really great to see you again um, in person because we never lost track from each other but but it's really really nice to be uh, in a closer contact now again so thank you for having us here uh, actually I mean uh, Christiane already pointed out a lot of the uh, of, of the interesting points of the department in my view my work um, after having spent almost 20 years of my career in Germany uh, my work at the department was very interesting from the very first day because I think not too many of my colleagues um, who asked me to kindly asked me to, to come back to Vienna, had too much of an idea what I should do there. So the, I mean, the, the planning was, was, let's get someone who works with Christiane and then let's see what they are doing. Um, and so there was a complete freedom, uh, at least in my feeling at the beginning, uh, what we could do. And, and, and so what I did and what Christiane and I did was that we really started from scratch something. So uh, how we thought or how we think that, such a department could look like. And we do it in the way that we do things differently, but still we cooperate closely. So, so that's the approach. My, my personal approach is probably more technology oriented. So my, my approach is more uh, that I understand myself also in a way as someone who works closely with computer scientists. Um, I, I, so I, I always try to stress this a little bit that I that I understand more than average about the technology behind things so so that is one of the one of my specific interests I would say the second one is I'm very much interested in everything which comes with data protection data security intellectual property on data so I do not really follow those typical German streams of legal domains so i tried to do it more in a in a in a horizontal or in a matrix structure i would say um, and i tried to do it uh, outstandingly internationally i would say so the, 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 the team i'm working with consists of uh, 20 people from all over the world literally uh, which is not very typical for a german speaking law school um, and, and we work in, in European projects and we work in international projects in, in our field of competence, which is IT and law. Yeah, and uh, I mean, that's, that's one uh, thing that uh, perhaps people who are not from a German speaking part of the world um, uh, don't have full insight and appreciation how hard it is actually in Europe to build interdisciplinary programs and build all these bridges across communities and I was just wondering uh, what your uh, feeling is also uh, Christiane based on, on your work uh, that you mentioned we're it seems at the moment where whether we want it or not whether we are organized in, in silos of disciplines or, or you know jurisdictions or whatever we have to work across disciplines and and um, that seems to me has always seemed super exciting and a great opportunity. Um, and I was just wondering how you look at, if you look, reflect on the past couple of years, what's your assessment? How far along have we come to build bridges, for instance, philosophy and, mm -hmm. and computer science or, or um, you know, behavioral science and law? What's, what's your feeling? I mean, uh, at times also it, it looks we have made a lot of progress but at the same time we all know I believe um, how difficult it is actually to find a common language across 
um, both um, disciplines and also as, as Nicolas pointed out, of course, across cultures and, and different um, uh, geographies. So it's just wondering what's your what's the pulse like in, 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 in Germany, in Austria, um, in, in Europe? How do you feel about the interdisciplinarity and, and also the young people you're interacting with at mm. the university? Well, I think the attitude has changed a lot over the past years. So if I, I try to remember how things used to be like five or even 10 years ago, everybody was really working in their silos. And when you suggested that, you know, you need to approach those topics from an interdisciplinary perspective, people would, you know, say, is this really necessary? I mean, what do these people have to tell us? Um, we're lawyers, we're self-sufficient. But I think that has really changed. Um, and, and in all the, the teams I've been working in um, recently, um, interdisciplinarity was really key. I mean, just take, for example, the German Data Ethics Commission. We wouldn't have achieved anything without so many disciplines working together. And same now in the Global Partnership on AI, where I just led a project on data governance. I mean, it's so wonderful. You work together with people from all continents, from all professions. And it's only by getting all these different perspectives that you manage to achieve something that's really good at the end of the day. So I think this is being accepted now. And it's just what we haven't really managed. And that is maybe something that is characteristic of the German speaking countries. We haven't really achieved to translate this insight into teaching, into the way um, faculties are structured. So there we still have a long way to go but um, otherwise I think it's pretty much accepted now that we need this. Because I was wondering I, I realize you you have a, a number of projects also focused on digital health specifically mm -hmm. which is an area that I'm uh, for many reasons personally uh, very interested in and um, just as, as you reflect on this interdisciplinarity and also the role your department plays, um, can you share a few insights how that works out in practice where um, you really bring together multiple disciplines yeah. and, and uh, you know, how do you build community around that? And is it mostly project as a starting point or do you start more with, I don't know, colloquias yeah. or whatever? No, no. So I, I have been working in this field of uh, ICT for health and law now for the last 15 years or so, mainly on a European level. Uh, and as as always, you know, there is a club of people knowing each other in a way, right? You need to enter, enter the group sometime. And if you enter the group and you behave properly, people tend to ask you again uh, whether you, you, you want to work with them again. Um, and, and those projects are typically funded by the European Union. The, the European Union is a very important funding source here in Europe because they, they have, as an average, clearly more money than national funding sources for interdisciplinary projects. So it's about 10 times to 20 times more money that you receive with such a project than an average Austrian or German or, or Italian project might bring. Um, and, and, and the typical project, I mean, of course, there are differences, but the typical project tries to bring together um, computer scientists, uh, medical experts, patient organizations, um, e all of them having one goal, which is to make medical treatment and research work better than before by better sharing of data. So that is the typical project. And then if it's a well-managed project, they, they find out quite quickly that if you start sharing data in Europe uh, that is sensitive, you better take care of the, uh, of the legal implications at the beginning of the project and not at the end. And, and our role then quite often is to try to, on the one hand, try to keep the project on, on track in, in the sense that they don't break the law, but at the same time also to try to find out uh, in how far the law needs to be extended, uh, reformed, etc., and try to bring this knowledge then back into the legal community and also back to the policy making process. This is, I mean, just building up on that, 
and also what Christiane mentioned before, like um, the emphasis also on, on the values and, and, uh, and you just uh, pointed to it as well mm -hmm. in the data flow context and data protection context. And, you know, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about uh, about the European trajectory, obviously there people stereotype and say, well, there's China with a surveillance approach, there's the US, you know, mm -hmm. with a hands-off, uh, laissez-faire, let innovation take care of things approach. And then there's Europe with a kind of a third way when it comes to digital technologies and, and regulation. And, and sometimes um, there is this mantra that, uh, you know, in Europe, we use law and or look at law more as a constraining force to say what's not allowed. And mm -hmm. and um, and yet in, in your department's title is the word innovation. Mm -hmm. And I know you 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 approach it the way that you see uh, law as also an enabler of innovation. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious. Um, what your reflections are, whether it's in um, within health or in any of the other areas, whether there is some sort of a larger awareness change, uh, uh, not only in Europe, but also in other parts of the world to maybe reconsider an old fashioned view on law where law is just seen as a hammer or as a constraint or something that you know, is, is against innovation uh, and maybe a new appreciation that, well, if we have safeguards in place, people trust more and they may also share more data and collaborate in different ways. Mm -hmm. and is that still just hope, wishful thinking on my part or would you say uh, we see some sort of a, a different, yeah, really a third way how to look at, at, at law and innovation and technology as some sort of a triangle? Well, first of all, I couldn't agree more with you that, uh, you know, we need to have a new uh, perspective on the law and see law as an enabling framework. Uh, what I experience time and again is that I sit on a panel and people ask me about, you know, what is your view on regulation? And I hate the R word. I don't use it I say no I'm not going to talk about regulation because once I use the term regulation there you know there are so many uh, connotations and, 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 and emotions that come with it so I prefer talking about uh, legal frameworks or uh, enabling frameworks but I have to confess I think that this uh, perspective is not the mainstream perspective yet I think still I experience like um, two camps, the camp that, you know, calls for regulation in terms of something, you know, having more law, more restrictions, and then the other camp calling for uh, more liberty. And this is not how we will make Europe a success. I would add that, I mean, if you read the official policy papers of the European Commission, in some way they, 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 they follow your argument saying that Europe needs to find a third way between the libertarian US approach and the Chinese uh, authoritarian approach. Um, so you can read quite a lot on this. Um, I think uh, the problem with this is that we are in, in, in Europe urgently uh, needing uh, the industry that could be regulated. So, so we have a lot of issues when it comes to innovative approaches in, in Europe. And, and in my view, uh, one of the reasons uh, that is the case might be that law is seen or was seen as a hindering factor, bringing all kinds of complexities, which doesn't make it too attractive to stay in Europe for some. And, and therefore, it's urgently needed that we need a new and, 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 and different approach about what, what law can and can't do when it comes to setting the scene for innovations. We talked already a, a little bit about change and uh, you know, how interdisciplinarity has made an entry into legal institutions like law schools um, or universities. 
um, I also realized that uh, your your department is doing quite some work and has as members in the community with focus on legal tech and mm. essentially turning the innovation question around, not so much how does law regulate the innovation of the technology and society that's out there, but vice versa now, well, how should we rethink law at a moment where the same technologies and dynamics also start to you know put pressure frankly on on the legal system um, and so I'm just uh, wondering again um, uh, you know where where do you see things going is, is uh, I mean there there is a version where um, digital transformation is, is some sort of seen as a pattern where one industry comes after the next you know we started with the entertainment industry, the good old times of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. And then we went you know, through publishing and transportation with Uber and so forth. Do you think something like that will happen to law or would you say, well, there's actually a real opportunity picking up on, on this conversation that um, we not just move towards the Uberization of law and have whatever legal tech uh, in a 1.0 or 2.0 sense, but that we go through kind of a renaissance moment of law where we start to reconsider more fundamentally what its role is as, you know, I, um, I maybe one of the few uh, remaining forces um, that protect human dignity, but also enable people to live their lives and to flourish. So how do you see some sort of the inbound effect, technology meets law and somehow law has to innovate? Are you more optimistic or are you more like pessimistic uh, uh, now maybe from a lawyer's perspective? Legal tech is your field. <laughs> so should <laughs> I, should I reply? Okay, so uh, <laughs> actually I may, uh, if I may, uh, very briefly, I think the first answer would be, uh, this is not really, it's not really new, right? So, I mean, uh, when, when I started in Hanover 20 years ago, uh, the department there was called Department for Legal Informatics. And there was a reason behind this, which is that the, the very beginning of this discipline I, I tried to stand for, somewhere in the seventies and eighties of the, of the 20th century in Europe, um, pretended to, to cover both, right? So the legal issues of information technology and information technology in the legal system. So that, that is not really new. The problem, however, is that the second stream, which is legal technology within the legal system, did not really survive very well uh, somewhere in the early 21st century because of all this, you know, all these information lawyers appearing. And interestingly, now when it when when the empire strikes back and 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 legal tech suddenly is a buzzword that appears also in law schools, there is a clear lack of people in law schools having the necessary technical understanding and the technical skills that are needed to to to, to understand what the technology means. And at the same time, there are not too many computer scientists who are really interested in in law because it's for them it's just you know it's an obscure field it's not the most attractive one at all and and that makes it very difficult in my view uh, for an average law school to teach this field because you can't i mean to have the competence within the teaching body to cover that so that's a huge opportunity for people who try to have a technological understanding would be my first answer second since i have been working in law the amount of work and the complexity of the whole infrastructure has significantly increased so it's the opposite is true from everything is getting easier and will be done by machines is getting more and more complicated. Third, um, there is a lot of change, obviously, and you need to understand this if you're young today, that most probably some of the things that the older generation has been doing for a living will no longer be there because it will be replaced by machines. And it's good that it will be replaced by machines because it will give you more time to, to do the interesting work, uh, which is the, the human argument on the legal issue. And I'm quite confident that the next generation, at least the next generation, will have plenty of work to, to be done there. So I think there are plenty of opportunities. The main issue that we have in law schools, at least in Europe, is we need to get the competence on really covering what's going on here. It's very easy to tell a 20-year-old law student 
artificial intelligence will replace everything in, uh, in the law. It's very difficult to teach them what AI really is and what it can or can't do. Yeah, that uh, rings true to me from uh, mm -hmm. personal experience and observation. So um, I'm cognizant of time. Uh, it's so fascinating to, to mm -hmm. uh, not only learn more about your work, um, but also really to, to reflect on some of these big questions and get mm -hmm. your insights. So, so um, I'm deeply grateful. Maybe to end with, um, uh, the global network brings together many um, centers also in parts of the world where um, capacity building is at earlier stages. Uh, um, Nicolas, you pointed out, and also uh, Christiane, uh, some of us have been in this field for, for quite a while and um, we've had the privilege to work with early organizations and academic centers in this space. And so I'm just wondering whether you have any advice to um, you know, smaller maybe research groups or units, or sometimes it's not even a center there yet or a department uh, for people who share an interest in this intersectionality and uh, particularly also often feel a passion that they want to help um, policymakers in particular to make better decisions, uh, companies as well, of course. And so, Christiana, given your extensive work in, in working with governments and policymakers, uh, reflecting on some of these interfaces, what would be your recommendation? How even to think about building these relationships that then lead to all these great things that we talked about? Where, what would you recommend? Well, I think it's important for uh, new research groups that want to, you know, bring their ideas to the fore and they want to see their ideas implemented to find the right channels. And I think this is why uh, networks such as the one uh, which, which you're leading um, are so important because these networks can provide platforms, can provide ch uh, channels also for smaller um, research groups to uh, uh, make their ideas heard. And there are also other platforms, for example, um, the, the European Law Institute, which I happen to uh, uh, be leading at the moment. This is also something like a platform for ideas. But I think your network is an ideal uh, a channel for uh, new and innovative ideas to be submitted to policymakers. So I think we have to think about these structures and uh, make use of these structures and enhance these structures. And this is why we're so happy also to, to be joining. Thank you. It is the wealth of networks and uh, clearly uh, it's been such a demonstration of the wealth of experience, wisdom and insight and also kindness. And uh, Nicolas, maybe a last word uh, over to you, uh, what your hopes are maybe for the coming year um, in terms of also collaborations or where you see some of the opportunities. So I, th I, I think that the most important opportunity for me is to learn from everyone who is in this group, because I think as far as I see it so far, it's a very diverse, it's a very international, international and a very interdisciplinary group. So it's exactly what I'm looking for. And this is also what I hope that we will be able to give here and also be able to receive, which is input from other jurisdictions, input from other understandings, how the law works and input from other disciplines apart from the law. And if this, if only half of my expectations become true, it will be a very successful year, I'm very sure. Fantastic. Thank you for uh, such an open invitation to continue the conversation over many different channels. Uh, this was a fantastic starting point. And again, uh, deeply appreciated that you took the time even late in the evening. Good talking to you. Thank you so much and we'll be in touch. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Be well. Thank you.